by the hills to the land where legend remains the stories of old fill the heart and may it come again hi my name is christopher johnson I'm an artistic associate here at the Rogue Theatre where I've been acting, directing, adapting, and producing plays since 2012. Today I'll be talking about Connor McPherson's career, his body of work, and the prominent writing characteristics that you'll encounter in his play, The Weir. I will also be providing examples from some of his other plays with help from our ensemble of actors. And I'll be giving some background on Irish pub culture and slang, all to help prepare you for some of what you'll be seeing and hearing in our production. I hope you enjoy it. I have no fear of or fascination with the supernatural, but when I was in middle school, seventh or eighth grade, my father passed away. And on the night it happened, I was taking a bath. Alone and with the door closed, I dipped my head back under the water and looked up. And there he was, lying flat on the ceiling and looking down at me, as if on the other side of a mirror above. We hadn't lived in the same state since I was an infant, so I didn't really know what he looks like, and I wouldn't find out for several more days that he had died that night, nearly 2,000 miles away. And yet, there he was above my estranged father, unmistakable if somewhat distorted by time, space, and soapy water. I sat up and he was gone. It was frightening, sure, but more confusing. I blamed it on my imagination. When I found out days later that he had died that night, I got a chill, which I kept to myself. A chill I'd been able to access in my memory with perfect clarity ever since, even with more than 20 years gone by. And it's funny because I don't believe in ghosts, but I'll never forget, forget the night I saw one. And that paradox and how we go about living in this world that if we're honest, we'll never fully understand is largely what Connor McPherson's play, The Weir, is all about. Not that McPherson necessarily has any answers for us. He likes to think of a play as a question and pit his characters against the unknown. Keep us all on the same page, so to speak. His body of work bounces back and forth pretty consistently between two primary subjects, violent crime and encounters with the other side. Life, death, and the tenuously thin membrane between them are always on his and his characters' minds. As a major Irish playwright, this dominant aspect of his voice isn't all that unusual. Remarking on the difference between Irish and English playwrights, McPherson says, I think that English drama is horizontal, in that it's a person on the flat of the earth looking around that plane, asking, how do I deal with other people on that plane, and how do we organize ourselves to deal with each other? And I think Irish drama is vertical, in that it's a person standing on the earth, but the concern is going all the way up into the sky and way down into the earth. There's very little concern usually with the organization of people on the same plane. The difference is the axis. And that's the reason, I think, for the soulfulness that comes into Irish drama and the connectedness to the dead and to God. A character in McPherson's first period play, The Veil, makes a similar, if rather cheeky, observation. While the city of London will present the ghoulish at every corner, a true doorway to the eternal seems to demand the spiritual quietude and awesomeness, as only desolate places such as Ireland may possess. Overcast skies, frigid rains, and even a bit of snow finally came to southern Arizona just in time for us to start rehearsals for the weir and it was a useful reminder of Ireland's natural proximity to nature and to the desire to hold each other close and to the lovely but ominous mystery of winter at night. It set an appropriate tone for us as we prepared to tell this particular story. Born and raised in the north of Ireland to an accountant and a housewife, 
Connor McPherson started writing and directing plays for University College Dublin's Drama Society about 1990, after starting out as a double major in English and philosophy. The first professional staging of one of his plays happened in 1992 at the nearby Fly By Night Theatre, a company he helped to start. And in 1997, McPherson's play St. Nicholas premiered in London. A one-man show featuring Brian Cox as a burnt-out theatre critic who becomes an unwilling familiar to a small nest of English vampires, it was a critical and commercial smash. Brian Cox would be the first of many great actors to repeatedly appear in McPherson's plays over the years, a group that also notably includes Kieran Hines. There's an interesting aside in the play in which the solo character takes a brief pause from his story to address the audience directly about their participation in the tale, and it makes for a good introduction to the playwright's attitude towards the supernatural. They have power. Not the power to make you do what they want, but real power. To make you want what they want. It hurts to consider things in their company. It becomes hard to make sense. They appeal to the older part of us. What we share with animals. Hmm. There's always going to be a smugness about you listening to this as we all take part in this convention, and you will say, these vampires are not very believable, are they? And you are entitled. This convention, these restrictions, these rules, they give us that freedom. I have the freedom to tell you this unhindered, while you can sit there assured that no one is gone to get hurt. Possibly offended, but you'll live. We're all quite safe here. Safe to say things like, if there were vampires, why don't their victims become vampires? And you are, of course, relying on the lazy notions foisted upon you by others in the effort to make you buy more popcorn. But when you find out that they're real, that all changes, you see. Let's think about it, will we, for a moment. If a vampire bites you, and you in turn become a vampire, that's a rule. A causal mechanical rule. Vampirism is deadly contagious. A rule that says their species, like ours, must survive. And that's natural, we suppose. And that seems to make sense. Fine. But we want it both ways. We want the vampire's bite to be magic. Death-defying, supernatural. Why? <laughs> Why do we need it to be magic? Because magic doesn't exist. We don't have to be afraid of what doesn't exist. Or is it because we envy them? We're jealous of the power to instill fear in others. And we can't have that. And if we can't, nothing can. But we never seem to think for a moment that nature is magic. We view nature scientifically. We can predict its laws. But, but our pride in doing this blinds us. Blinds us to the simple fact. We don't know why there are laws at all. We may know the Earth goes around the sun, and we may know that this is due to gravity, but none of us knows why there's gravity. So don't sit there and cast judgment on the credibility of what I say when you don't even know why you aren't floating out of your seats. There are no vampires to be found in the weir, but there is some discussion of other mythical creatures. In an interview with Filmmaker Magazine, McPherson says, My granddad used to tell me stories about fairies and things like that, like out in the countryside. And it all would have been real to a generation before him. So, yeah, I was fascinated by those whenever I heard them. 
and Ireland being a very Catholic country as well, supernatural reality seems to permeate everyone's life. We live in a mysterious environment that we don't understand. We are told that the universe is infinite. Time is relative. If you speed up, time slows down. Those things are bewildering. This sense of underlying bewilderment, or the vertical approach to storytelling, is present in varying degrees in each of his plays, and may be most prominent in the play I've come to talk about today. Not six months after St. Nicholas opened, the Weir premiered at the Royal Court's 40-seat upstairs venue in London. The production won the Olivier Award for Best New Play and transferred to the West End, where it garnered international acclaim. It was only supposed to run for three weeks, but ran closer to three years before its final curtain and another transfer, this time to Broadway. Today, The Weir is widely considered one of the most significant dramas of the 20th century. McPherson, I should note, was a mere 25 years old at the time of its writing. He has remained on close terms with success as a writer and director since then, often taking the reins as director once he's readied a new script for its first production, a practice which is generally unheard of, if not completely taboo in professional theater. For me, he says, the first production of a play is really an extension or even a continuation of the writing of the play, because only when you see it coming to life can you really understand what it is. When you reach the end of that journey, sometimes your feeling is, that there's not a lot to discover. You're also slightly disappointed because you've seen it. In a way, you've wrecked your dream by making it real. Which is not to say that it's bad, but just that that particular process is at an end. Once he's directed the premiere of a new script, McPherson typically never returns to it, moving on to the next new idea in order to stay creative. His plays are mostly original, but he's also adapted Chekhov and Strindberg over the years. Of his adaptations, his most regularly produced would probably be his one-act take on The Birds, adapted not from the Hitchcock film, but the original British novella by Daphne du Maurier. On the best advice he received when starting out, he remembers Harold Pinter pulling him aside after one of his early plays and telling him, Listen, don't let any of the bastards give you any fucking shit. <laughs> like most playwrights, like most Irish playwrights, McPherson notes Pinter and Beckett as major influences. It's a wonder we haven't produced one of his plays here at The Rogue before. Unfolding in real time, over the course of about an hour and 40 minutes, the Weir concerns a small group of barflies who gather together one night in a rural Irish pub to exchange ghost stories of the increasingly personal variety. There's a good deal of drama without a villain of any kind, and plenty of warmth and laughter despite many chilling moments throughout. First, we meet the sprightly but cantankerous old-timer, Jack, owner of a local garage and perpetual bachelor. Brendan is the young owner of the pub, which he operates out of the back of his converted farmhouse likely what's keeping him from settling down and starting a family. Like most good bartenders, Brendan has more to say about other people than he does about himself. Bachelor number three is the quiet but intelligent Jim, Jack's assistant at the garage and sole caretaker to his fast declining mother. All three men seem to hold their own loneliness close, as if in fear someone might take it away from them at any moment. Jack and Jim are flush with cash this night and can drink to their heart's content, having won big betting on horses earlier in the day. Not terribly worried about making or losing money himself, Brendan's enforcement of their bar tabs is a relaxed one. It's clear that these are his friends before they're his customers. Next, we meet real estate maven and restaurateur Finbar who took the wealth he inherited from his father and used it to buy up all the available property in town, which he now sells or develops when he isn't doing odd jobs in his own restaurant and bar that might help him to hire a few less employees. Finbar arrives at Brendan's pub for the first time in God knows, according to Jack, with an affable but tight-lipped young woman 
named Valerie. Finbar has sold Valerie a long empty house nearby and, since she's arrived alone, is giving her a kind of tour of the area with their last stop at Brendan's pub. Jack has been bristling with resentment in anticipation of Finbar, who is married, bringing a single woman to the bar as if to show off his continued ability to attract women from the confines of wedlock. As far as the audience is informed, a woman hasn't set foot in this particular pub in years, despite its wealth of unattached men. But once all five of our characters are met, it becomes clear that Valerie's sudden and unexplained appearance is to be the driving mystery of the night. She offers up no clarity about why she's left Dublin for the dark, deserted roads of the countryside. And so the men bicker with one another and tell Valerie what they know about the area. Finbar is trying to remember a story about a widow woman who lived nearby and supposedly had a strange encounter with fairy folk knocking at the windows, but he can't remember to whom or in what house it happened. Jack remembers, but gives fair warning before telling the tale because, of course, the potentially haunted house in question is the one Finbar just sold to Valerie. This sets off an evening of ghost stories, most having taken place in the surrounding area. Rather than scaring Valerie off, however, she is only made more at home by the frightening tales and finally reveals to us why she abandoned the light and safety of the city. You'll have to wait and see the play to find out just what that revelation is. Not unlike the moment in St. Nicholas in which we are reminded that we don't really know why we aren't floating off of our seats in the theater and shouldn't close our minds to the experiences being related to us from the stage, McPherson again makes a sort of plea to the audience, albeit in a much less confrontational manner this time. The character of Jack, remember, has just won big, betting on horses, and is forced to defend his method as a gambler who seldom takes a reliable tip over his own historically bad instincts, saying, Jimmy has a scientific approach. He studies the form, and no offense, he has a bit of time to be doing that, tinkering with his figures and his, you know. He'd be in here with the paper up on the counter there for weeks, but I'm more, ah, sure, I'll have an old bet. And to tell you the truth, I don't be too bothered. It's a bit of fun, and that's what it should be. And so I'm not going to listen to do this and do that and you'll be right just to get a few bob. There's no fun in that and the principle of it, you know? It's the luck. It's the something that's not the facts and figures of it. McPherson's groan as a writer of subtlety and detail in the short interim since penning St. Nicholas. Through Jack's speech, he gently reminds us to enjoy the ride and not let our preconceived notions of this or that sap the experience of its possibilities. But he does so by virtue of adding further dimension to his characters and plot. He's also painting a kind of picture for us of the type of person who might be more likely than not to believe or at least entertain a ghost story. There's a prominent psychologist by the name of Daniel Kahneman, famous for his work on judgment and decision making, who theorizes that human beings have two basic ways of thinking, a reactionary thought process that comes to decisions quickly but is sometimes flawed, and a slower but ultimately more accurate process of interpreting events. To paraphrase, fast thinkers and slow thinkers. Christopher French, a psychologist in the UK, asks us to consider Kahneman's theory like this. Imagine there's a caveman who hears a rustling in the bushes nearby. Now, he can either think fast and react by assuming right away that it's a predator and immediately flee to survive another day. Or he can rely on slow, evidence-based thinking, in which case he would be fine and preserve his energy. Or he could wind up well-rested but violently devoured by a much bigger animal. Descending more successfully from the reactionary, fast-thinking man, human beings have lived to tell the tale, so to speak. But in the process, we've evolved to misinterpret realities that we might find threatening as a means of surviving a world fraught with moving shadows. 
But before I take too much fun out of it, I have to say that the weir isn't about the stories we tell ourselves to survive. It's about the comfort and community to be found in the act of telling stories to one another. As Jack says, it's a bit of fun, and that's what it should be. Most criticism of McPherson and his work rightly identifies him as a born storyteller and advocate of the form. But he's also frequently credited as an astute observer of the melancholy masculinity of Irish men. The contentedly lonely trio of bachelors we first meet in the Weir are good examples of this. But my favorite comes from McPherson's coming of age small crime thriller, This Lime Tree Bower. The story is narrated by three young men, including 17-year-old Joe. I spent the evening with Fergus and Noel. We were mates since being kids. They called for me and we had nowhere to go. We went down to the rocks where the shipwreck was. The tide was out and we could see most of it. We were never allowed to swim out near it because a boy got stuck in it one time and died. But that was back in the 70s and none of us knew him. The story was that the ship was carrying guns for the IRA in 1920 or something. And the captain was an English fellow who had fallen in love with a girl in town. And she was in the women's IRA. And she got him to bring the guns over in the night. But she was supposed to marry some farmer further up the coast. And he had found out. And he tipped off the black and tans. So they arrested the girl in her house and captured the IRA men who were going down to the beach to get the guns. But the girl knocked over an oil lamp in the house and there was a huge fire. This warned the captain of the, of the boat and he scuttled it. He was drowned. And because a British soldier died in the fire, the girl was hung. That was the story the old lads and Reynolds used to say about it. But Frank told me the boat belonged to a fisherman called Vinty Dogan who crashed it after drinking a bottle of Powers. It was hard to know who to believe. The town was full of spoofers. Dad said he wouldn't get involved in the dispute because he was from Italy and it was none of his business. He said Irish people would rather make something up and if that's what they like to do, then he had no problem. When I told him he was forgetting I was Irish, he told me to believe what I liked, or better still, make up my own spoof about the boat. But I wasn't really bothered. I just liked looking at it. Lots of things could have been true. Who knows? Fergus and Noel were sculling rocks at the boat, and I was having a piss in the sea when I saw a girl I fancied. Deborah something, up on the promenade. She was walking along with some bloke, I felt shit. When I got home, the chipper was closed. Frank and Carmel and Ray and Dad were watching some film with lawyers and rain. But only Carmel was really watching it. The men were drinking and chatting. I said goodnight and had a shower. There were clean sheets on my bed and on Frank's. I looked at Frank's books. He had a lot of thrillers and westerns. I liked his books because the sentences were always short. The writers gave you the facts. In school, we did books where nobody said what they meant, and you had to work out what everybody wanted. These books knew how to be read. They usually started with somebody looking at their watch. Jack Brannigan looked at his watch and quietly cursed. That type of thing. They also had good sex bits. Girls whose nipples went as hard as peach stones and their soft skin became covered in goosebumps. The blokes all had big mickeys and they came quickly the first time. The next time was leisurely. I read 50 pages of this book. The ex-cop was a drunk, but he was trying to stay sober. He was looking for the daughter of a drug dealer who'd been kidnapped. And he knew the city. But it was changing. It was summer. I went under the covers and curled up in the clean sheets. I was an ex-cop. 
but I had good in me. I can't speak to the experience of specifically Irish masculinity, but I can certainly relate to a melancholy one. There's an accessibility to McPherson's work on display here. His influences, his characters and settings are all overtly Irish, but they transcend national identity. His plays both represent and reach out across his own cultural and geographical borders, which is why his plays are produced the world over. To romanticize your own feelings of shame, despair, or isolation as a means of managing them is certainly a human behavior, but it might be a behavior that the Irish do a bit better or with more natural poetry than the rest of us. I don't know, maybe I'm being reductive. The, the beauty of the writing is undeniable, that's all. Something else I am reminded of by that speech from this lime tree bower is the utilization of coincidence in impactful storytelling. The girl's sea captain lover was drowned, and because a British soldier died in the fire, the girl was hanged. If you'll remember back to my own personal ghost story about seeing my dead father on the night he passed away, credence seems to be lent to my sighting when I point out that I didn't learn he had died until several days later. A frightening image is conjured, and then evidence arises that would appear to validate it beyond dispute, heightening the fear or chill we feel at the story's revelation. You'll find plenty of these kinds of coincidences in the various ghost stories that McPherson's characters tell in the weir. Startling, disturbing, goosebump-inducing coincidences. They're magic tricks, really. Impressive on the surface, but ultimately a diversion from the likely reality upon further inspection. Not to be cynical, but coincidences are only remarkable when we notice them and when we deny their everyday frequency. I was listening to This American Life on my way to rehearsal for the Weir one Sunday, and they were doing an episode on coincidence. None of the stories were ghostly per se, but the host reflected that coincidences are a natural gateway to bigger questions about the meaning of life and the universe. Is there a God, an afterlife, a reason to fear eternity? Do I have a destiny that's being somehow affirmed if I look close enough? Are we being observed and guided by a power or presence we don't understand? Did I see my dead father on the ceiling? A coincidence is something we can hold on to when navigating these murky waters. A guiding light in the unknown, even if it's just a reflection of our own inquiring spirit flashing back at us. It keeps our need for understanding alight, sparks it anew. And that's what I think McPherson is after in his use of them, keeping us entertained in our seats, but alive with the excitement of much bigger questions when we float away out of them once the play is over. Something you'll find throughout McPherson's body of work is characters over the age of 50 prominently featured center stage. About this, he says, I just think that I instinctively feel that there's something very dramatic about older people on stage. Because if you've got a young person in trouble, once you get them out of trouble, their whole life is ahead of them. But if you've got an older person struggling, the stakes feel higher because it could be the last chance saloon. In his 2013 play, The Night Alive, three crusty old bachelors are living in squalor in Dublin and learn the hard way that no good deed goes unpunished when they take in a young prostitute from the streets. I've only just read the play, but the physical violence that is inflicted upon the characters as a consequence of their altruism is especially harrowing considering their advanced age, even just to read on the page. Fortunately, it's as funny and hopeful as it is dark and intense. Even McPherson's darkest plays have a side-splitting sense of humor to them. This is a storytelling quality we are always looking out for at The Rogue. A two and a half hour play about even the headiest of subjects goes down a lot easier with a few laughs along the way. In his 2006 play, The Seafarer, a poker game is held on Christmas Eve in a dark and moldy basement in Dublin. The main character, a small time criminal long past his prime by the name of Sharky, 
discovers that one of the men at the table, a newcomer by the name of Mr. Lockhart, is in fact a Mephistophelian entity who has come to wager for Sharky's soul. In a rare private moment between hands, Mr. Lockhart illustrates to Sharky the eternity that awaits him should he lose his soul over cards this Christmas Eve. What's hell? <laughs> hell is... Well, you know, Sharky, when you're walking around and round the city and the street lights have all come on and it's cold. Or you're standing outside a shop where you're hanging around reading the magazines, pretending to buy one because you have no money and nowhere to go and your feet are like blocks of ice in those stupid little slip-on shoes you bought for chauffeuring. And you see all the people who seem to live in another world all snuggled up together in the warmth of a tavern or a cozy little house and you just walk and walk and walk. And you're on your own, and nobody knows who you are. And you don't know anyone, and you're trying not to hassle people or beg because you're trying not to drink. And you're hoping you won't meet anyone you know because of the blister and shame that rises up in your face. And you have to turn away because you know you can't even deal with the thought that someone might love you because of all the pain you always cause. Well, that's a fraction of the self-loathing you feel in hell. Except it's worse. Because there truly is no one to love you. Not even him! He lets you go. Even he's sick of you. You're locked in a space that's smaller than a coffin, and it's lying a thousand miles down under the bed of a vast icy pitch black sea. You're buried alive in there and it's so cold that you can feel your angry tears freezing in your eyelashes and your very bones ache with deep perpetual agony and you think I must be going to die. But you never die. You never even sleep. Because every few minutes you're gripped by a claustrophobic panic and you get so frightened you squirm uselessly against the stone walls and the heavy lid you've banged your head off a million times. And your heart beats so fast your ribs against your ribs you think, I must be going to die. But of course, you never will. Because of what you did and what you didn't do. The stakes McPherson talks about in writing for older characters in trouble seem especially agonizing in the case of Sharky. Not only does he not have his whole life ahead of him, the real terror lies in the eternity that it may be too late for him to avoid, whether he sees it to Christmas morning or not. The idea of having your whole life ahead of you or the daily weight of our accumulated lives is a thread that appears regularly throughout McPherson's plays. As Jack says with regret in the weir of a falling out he once had with a girl in his youth, and the future was all ahead of me. Years and years of it, I could feel it coming. All those things you've got to face on your own. There's no villain in the weir, but if the play had a hero, it would be Jack, the onerous but lovable old-timer at center stage. He doesn't get the girl in the end, he's not that kind of hero. Neither does he suffer any physical violence or find himself in any kind of desperate bind. But he does sort of save the day, in a subtle way, by extending an extraordinary gesture of empathy to Valerie after she finally reveals her mystery to the men in the pub. Valerie's ghost story centers on a significant personal loss, the kind most of us would be hard-pressed to share with anyone, let alone a room full of strangers. But it's getting late now, and two of the five characters head home 
leaving just Jack, Valerie, and Brendan, who insists they sit by the fire and have a last drink for the road. Structurally, the play has climaxed with Valerie's story and the mood has darkened significantly. She's suffered a shocking heartbreak that there's no sure way to mend, let alone comfort. Now sitting by the fire, Jack tells the final ghost story of the night. And unlike his first story about the fairy folk, this one is of a personal nature. Clearly not something he would usually share, but Valerie has stirred something in Jack this night. In a lovely twist, it is the only story told in the play that doesn't have the slightest hint of the supernatural. It's simply a story of the girl who got away and how the most insignificant seeming loss can result in decades of burdensome regret. Like I said, there's nothing otherworldly about Jack's last story, but it is a heartrending reminder that no matter what we believe or have seen in our small allotment of time on Earth, we all have our ghosts. Who we were 10 years ago is as intangible a phantom as any shadow that might startle us in the night. And that's the play. After Jack tells the final story, Brendan offers him and Valerie a ride home. It's just a couple of pages left in the script as Brendan locks up the pub and Jack and Valerie put their coats on. But something has changed. A quiet but seismic shift has taken place in the tone of the proceedings. Hearts seem fuller, lighter somehow, by virtue of the culmination of storytelling that has taken place. The worst, it would seem, has already happened. And with new friends made, there is hope renewed for better days and that we'll meet again. If you're watching this talk, I likely don't need to sell you a ticket to the play, but I just have to say that the Weir is truly a masterpiece, a, a casual masterpiece that may not be for everyone. The gentle and soft-spoken kind that mostly stays seated and rarely raises its voice. It's about discarding small grudges and stumbling gently into the embrace of community. It's about the curative properties of openly sharing what we have to say and the uncomplicated balm of just being heard. With a meditative rhythm to the repeated telling of stories and buying of drinks, the weir has been a unique challenge to direct in that I've had to handle the story and characters as little as I can stand to so as not to interfere with its masterful simplicity. Just to touch a little bit more on my direction of the play, especially in this time of COVID-19, I'll forewarn you that when watching The Weir, you are going to see adult actors blatantly pretending to drink beer and smoke cigarettes through their face masks. It's a naturalistic play set in a pub, and I just didn't have the heart to cut the drinking and smoking. And with an audience as smart as you are, I feel good about putting door frames on stage without putting up walls to hold them. That's your job. Joe and I were talking about this before rehearsal the other day, and we both agree that once you start putting up wallpaper on your set, you've effectively left the theater behind and instead enter the realm of television. Not to mention, I'm fully confident we have the support of the playwright and some of our more bare-bones methods of theatricality. The magic of a play, McPherson says, is that you actively are dreaming. At every point, you are being reminded of its artificiality, that these people are pretending. But what's so interesting is there's almost an ancient telepathy between the audience. It's like a church service where the story unfolds before us. It's dark, you have to strain to suspend disbelief, but the effort you make pulls you into a deeper trance. Before we part ways today, I'd like to talk about Irish pub culture and some Irish idioms that are used in the play that may not be familiar to you. First, let's talk slang. A knock refers to a large hill or mound. Cop is something you have or don't and refers to common sense. A uh, colchi is a derogatory term for someone who lives in the country, sort of like redneck. A small one is a shot of whiskey and is usually served with a pint, although it can also be sipped by itself. Gas means fun or funny, as in, we had a gas time, or he's a gas old-timer. 
and headers, or headbangers, refers to people who are lacking in mental acuity, to uh, put it mildly. The last bit of translation I want to do is of the expression, your man. Your man doesn't, in fact, denote ownership or even familiarity so much as the complete opposite. It essentially means this guy or some guy. I bumped into your man outside is how you would say some jackass walked right into me. The connotation isn't necessarily negative, but is more likely to be used as neutral or a bit less than positive. At least, that's my understanding. Now that we've got that out of the way, I want to give you a quick primer on Irish pub culture, the backdrop against which the weir takes place. Pub ownership in Ireland is usually passed down in families over several generations, and the pubs themselves, not as much nowadays, but traditionally, often serve as makeshift community centers, especially in more rural areas where there's usually nowhere else to go. A lot of pubs sell groceries and farm equipment alongside alcohol. Some bartenders even double as town undertakers. You're a lot less likely to hear or see much television in a pub as compared to, say, an American bar. Folks are just as likely stepping into a pub for the conversation as they are for the drinks, if not more so. The social aspect is probably the dominant factor in the necessity and function of the Irish pub. They're largely where and how the Irish have looked after each other through all their long troubles. Another significant aspect of Irish pubs are the history that they hold. Some of these institutions have floors made up of 200-year-old flagstones that aren't level. They're crumbling and hazardous, but the owners won't replace them because they know full well their customers would revolt. To upgrade the counter or floor of an Irish pub is to disrespect the heritage therein and would rob future generations of a vital link to their own history. When a regular patron passes away, their picture usually goes up on the wall. Maybe a hat they wore is hung from the rafters over their favorite bar stool so the living can go on drinking with their friends who have passed. Better still, the living can find comfort in the idea that someday, when they have passed on, they too will be able to come back to their favorite pub for another pint with friends on both sides of the veil. A pub is a place where time just isn't as potent, where the world doesn't spin as fast or change as violently. Considering that some of these pubs have liquor licenses dating back as far as 1833, it's not hard to imagine how the Irish might have accumulated some good ghost stories over the years. And that's my talk. I hope you enjoy the weir. Until we meet again, cheers and good luck. Come by the hills to the land where legend remains. The stories of old fill the heart and may it come again. Where the past has been lost, the future is still